The Night Beat starts right now. And we begin tonight with our first look at Bear County's COVID-19 case numbers from the past weekend. The numbers weren't available until tonight's daily briefing as Metro Health's data tracking team took the weekend off. Mayor Ron Nuremberg revealing an increase of 72 new confirmed cases on Friday, 16 new cases on Saturday, five from Sunday. Of those numbers, we know 23 were the result of community transfer. 37 came from the Bear County Jail, five from nursing homes. No new deaths were reported over the weekend. And that brings us to our current total for Bear County, which is 2,213. This number, though, as we mentioned, not reflected on Metro Health's dashboard as the numbers are currently only updated through last Friday. The mayor says they'll continue to update the dashboard regularly starting tomorrow. It's also worth noting tonight that half of all positive cases in Bear County have fully recovered. And the mayor says we now have the capacity to administer up to 3,000 tests per day. We will have more corrections coronavirus coverage coming up in just a few minutes. Yeah, but first fire officials still trying to figure out what started a massive fire that destroyed two homes on the southeast side near Floresville last night. The family which lived in one of those homes devastated after losing everything, including their animals. The night team's Jaffney Gray spoke with them while they were sifting through what was left. This is what remains after massive flames captured by this cell phone tore through a mobile home and an apartment behind it just off of Highway 181 South. <laughs> It's, everything's gone. Lori Farr says their family was getting ready to lock their doors for the night when the blaze approached their doorstep. He said, Mama, he ran out. Mama, Mama, there's fire outside. Fortunately, Farr got her fiance, her 11 year old son, and her 71 year old mother, who has type 2 diabetes, out safely. Sadly, she lost all four of her small chihuahuas. They're right there in the box. I miss them. My baby. These steps lead to the entrance of the trailer home. But just to give you an idea of the layout, this was supposed to be the living room right there, a bedroom. But if you look all the way down there, another bedroom, as you can see, is totally unrecognizable. Barr was able to save some family photos and an American flag that belonged to her son's grandfather, who was a veteran. Among the memories she did lose, her brother's ashes. Her landlord, Bobby Bain, joined the family for cleanup efforts today. When I was coming, you know, you could see the flames from a long distance away and it was just very, very hurtful, you know, to, to lose this. They say though it may be hard to bounce back, they're just thankful nobody died. I just thank God that my mama's safe, my son's safe, my fiance's safe, and that we're all made it out safe. Jaffany Gray, KSAT 12 News. New on the night beat, Bear County Sheriff's deputies arresting a 23 year old man. They say shot two people at a car wash on the northeast side earlier this month. Taryn Bowie was arrested today on two counts of aggravated assault. Deputies say the two victims went to meet Bowie at a high tech car wash on Lakeview Drive to sell him an Xbox. When they arrived, they say Bowie came around the corner of the building and opened fire. The victims, both teenagers shot in the foot and the back. They are expected to survive. Also happening this evening, police are still investigating a shooting on the east side. Officers were originally called out to the block to the 4800 block of Alfred Drive, where they believed two groups were shooting at each other. But when they got there, all they found was a vehicle with its rear window shot out. They then received a call for help from the 500 block of Gembler nearby. That's where they found a 24 year old man who had been shot in the arm. They believe he drove himself there from the first location. Police say the man is not cooperating. No arrests have been made. We know there's going to be more physical interaction, so there's uh, going to be uh, more potential spread of this virus. It just requires us to do two things, in my mind. One, uh, be mindful of the public health guidance. The second part uh, is to make sure that as we begin to open up, that um, we're watching the data, that we're vigilant, and that we continue to see the data move in the right direction, which it is now. And if we see some things not going in the right direction, that we're willing to say, you know what, let's slow down a little bit and make sure we do it the right way. Mayor Ron Nuremberg reacting tonight to Governor Greg Abbott's reopening announcement. Under phase two of that announcement, child care centers, office buildings, personal care services like massage and beauty parlors, youth sports, and gyms 
can uh, are allowed to open immediately. On Friday, May 22nd, bars, bowling alleys, bingo halls, skating rinks, rodeos, zoos, aquariums, and natural caverns are permitted to open. Then on Sunday, May 31st, youth day camps, overnight youth camps, and some professional sports will also be allowed to resume. We are getting through this, but now more than ever, we need to work together as one Texas. So as we move into phase two, be a good neighbor, be a Texan. In addition, school districts will be allowed to begin summer school classes on June 1st. Also important to note, many which will soon be allowed to open, namely bars and office spaces, must do so at limited capacity. You can find those details right now on KSAT.com. We've seen COVID-19 outbreaks at nursing homes, not just here, but around the country. Residents living in those homes are at a higher risk due to underlying medical conditions. The issue has prompted a statewide effort to test residents and staff at nursing homes. New Braunfels and Bolverde Spring Branch firefighters are now set to begin testing at homes in Comal County. Tiffany Huertas explains their plan. They're a very, very vulnerable population. Starting tomorrow, the New Braunfels Fire Department will begin conducting COVID-19 tests at four of Kamau County's six nursing homes. So we were requested by the uh, Texas Commission on Fire Protection and the Texas Division of Emergency Management to assist in testing um, all nursing home clients and staff uh, as part of the governor's orders to get those folks tested. Fire Chief Patrick O'Connell says they will be testing about 1,200 people over the next four days. He says they will begin with testing staff. Once they get most of the staff tested, the staff can then assist them in testing uh, the residents. Joining us on Tuesdays, as she usually does, Dr. Ruth Bergeron with the Long School of Medicine. During an interview last week with KSAT, Dr. Ruth Bergeron explained why the death toll from the virus is so high in nursing homes. She says people in nursing homes have multiple underlying medical conditions, and the living arrangements within nursing homes also play a factor. Most nursing homes don't have the luxury of having a private bedroom with a private bath for each individual, and there are frequently rooms Mates and shared facilities. Dr. Bergren says another increased factor is the mobility of caregivers. Caregivers go from room to room, and so you can have spread if the caregivers are not maximally using their PPE and remembering about their hand hygiene. There are 71 positive cases confirmed in Kamal County. A spokesperson for the county says they haven't had any positive tests come from nursing homes yet. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center is running low on blood and could use your help to replenish its supply. Right now, the center is down to a two-day inventory. They say the need has increased 49% in the past week, likely due to elective surgeries resuming across the state. To help meet the need, a blood drive was held inside Rolling Oaks Mall this morning, and there are plenty of other opportunities to give this week. A three day blood drive at the Alamo Dome starts on Thursday. Donors will receive a $10 HEB gift card for every donation. $5 will also be donated to the San Antonio Food Bank for those donations. You can schedule an appointment by calling the number on your screen 210-731-5590 or visiting southtexasblood.org. And of course, you can find all this information on ksat.com. Bats are getting a bad name recently, thanks in large part to the pandemic. But here in Texas, they're considered a vital part of our agricultural economy and ecosystem. The night team's Patty Santos tells us there's ongoing efforts to protect them from viruses, most recently the coronavirus. A bat is the only flighted mammal in the world. We need them desperately. Yeah, this is Robin. Mm -hmm. There's 36 species that live in Texas, mm -hmm. and we need every single one of them. Now that's rare. Michelle Camara, a wildlife yeah. conservationist, is going to bat for the bats in Texas. This is a bat that will eat 6,000 bugs in a night. She wants the community to know bats are not dangerous. These ones will live about eight years. In fact, they're pretty helpful to yeah, Texans. So Just the Mexican free tail bats in Texas save farmers in the order of $1.2 billion a year and reduced 
pesticide needs. So important, Texas Parks and Wildlife recently hired a bat expert to continue to learn more about the mammals. I find that people are are pretty proud of the bats that we have here and seem to be pretty interested in them. State mammologist Jonah Evans says bats in our region are commonly known to potentially contract rabies like cats and dogs. He says there's no indication that North American bats carry any form of coronavirus. But there are studies gearing up to see if they can become infected and carry the disease. If they could carry the disease, one, it could make bats sick and it could kill bats potentially. The other is we don't want it to create another reservoir for the disease to potentially get into other animals, potentially get back to people. And they'll have different crevices on their face. Testing for coronavirus is not yet available for bats, but new guidelines have been set for those who have permits to handle them. Any wildlife rehabilitator, they can still receive injured and sick bats into their facility, but they are not allowed to release them into the wild until we have more information. Um, on how on the potential risk here. San Antonio is less than an hour away from Bracken Bat Cave, one of the largest congregation of mammals in the world. It is estimated that anywhere between 5 and 20 million bats are in that cave. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. A success two years in the making. In April of 2018, bipartisan legislators and a Jewish nonprofit called Hadassah proposed the Never Again Education Act. Last week, the federal bill passed, ensuring $10 million over the next five years will be dedicated to mandatory Holocaust education in schools nationwide. The night team's Courtney Friedman spoke with a local Hadassah president about why this law is so important and got so much support. My father was a refugee from Germany, so and he served in the U.S. Army in World War II, but he had relatives who went through the camps. Marion Bernstein is the president of San Antonio's chapter of Hadassah, an international Jewish nonprofit supporting a spectrum of missions. Bernstein has dedicated a lot of time to ensuring Holocaust education will continue for future generations. Our children and our grandchildren have no idea. They don't have that immediate connection and soon the last of the survivors will be gone. Hadassah teamed up with U.S. representatives and senators to create the Never Again Education Act, supporting Holocaust education curriculums for schools to prevent genocide, hate and bigotry nationwide. After two years, it finally passed last week. It specifically tasks the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., with expanding its education programming and distributing it to schools across the country. It authorizes $10 million over five years for that museum's program development, local, regional, and national workshops, teacher trainings, and education materials and field trips to museums. Absolute joy. I was so grateful, too, to our uh, legislators to put this together and to vote for it. You know, it took Republicans and Democrats, it took everybody to get on board. During a politically tense time, it's a great example of bipartisanship to support a bill that encourages our nation to be more inclusive, understanding, and compassionate. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Also a big success this year, the state of Texas passing a bill that mandates schools to observe Holocaust Memorial Week every year. That effort began with four local San Antonio women. Next on the night beat a bombshell out of the White House against FDA warnings. President Donald Trump revealing today he's been taking an anti malaria drug for more than a week in an effort to avoid contracting COVID-19. A new reality in America, all 50 states easing restrictions this week with Americans eager to return to normal. This is the country marks another grim milestone. More than 90,000 Americans losing their lives to COVID-19. ABC's Romina Puga has more. As he pushes for America's reopening, President Trump making a surprise statement Monday. I'm taking it, hydroxychloroquine. When? Right now, yeah. yeah when? A couple of weeks ago, I started taking it. Because I think it's good. I've heard a lot of good stories. 
In response to an unrelated question, the president announcing he'd been taking the unproven anti-malaria drug along with zinc. He said he asked a White House doctor if he could take it, even though he says he does not have the virus or any symptoms. Just last month, the FDA warned against using the drug for COVID-19 outside of hospitals or clinical trials because it could cause heart problems. According to the FDA, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine have not been shown to be safe and effective for treating or preventing COVID-19. This as American biotech company Moderna, working on a vaccine, says all 45 of their test patients are producing antibodies that fight the disease. Norman Hume of Atlanta receiving his second dose. And it's been like almost nothing. It's you know, literally, it's been like getting a flu shot. The company tested the blood of eight of those participants against the actual coronavirus, and in all eight cases mounted an immune response against the virus. Also on Monday, more than 130,000 auto workers were back on the job for the first time in eight weeks. The big three car makers restarting production. Life is risk. I think this is a minor one. I'm willing to take it to put food on the table. While other businesses defy state orders, telling them to stay closed. <laughs> a New Jersey gym determined to open its doors. Social distancing rules in place, temperatures taken out the door. Police put owners on notice, but no order to shut down. By Wednesday, all 50 states will have eased restrictions. Cases are still rising in at least 10 states, but at a plateau in at least 24 states. In Colorado, Romina Puga, ABC News. <laughs> Take a live look outside with live cam. It's a pretty shot right there. 84 degrees right now. Yep, and the heat is back. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. Here we go. We had some good rain Friday night and uh, leading us into a nice weekend. Now the heat, it's here and we're talking record challenging heat. Today we made it to 94 for the afternoon high. The average is 88 degrees and we were four degrees shy of the record this afternoon. But you look across the state and you look at the readings, 105 Midland, San Angelo 100, Del Rio made it above 100. We're feeling the heat. And it's going to intensify a little bit for tomorrow. So let's talk about this, starting with a look outside and what we have going on right now. Actually, very seasonable conditions. And by the way, in this time lapse, you see this bright light dropping? That is Venus right there, just left of the 84 degree temperature reading. Venus just set outside. Dew point is 60, so really not overly humid. So it's going to be hot, but not overly humid. 84 degrees right now. That's here in San Antonio. 70s north of town and in parts of the hill country. Still 90 in Del Rio. Pleasanton 81 and 82 in Hondo. Across the state, we still have a few 90s out there, especially Midland area. Midland at 92 degrees. So what's causing this? Well, we're all familiar with the big blue H, the big upper level high, the big ridge that's in place. Now that's that big bump in the upper level wind flow that's right up the plains and centered right over Texas. Now flanking it on each side, disturbances with good moisture, creating a lot of precipitation. You look at the west coast, you go east of the Mississippi, we've got a similar situation. Wedged in the middle is Texas, right underneath the big upper level high, big blue H. So the heat high is in place. It's gonna press down on us even more as we get into tomorrow. So here's what that means for high temperatures. We're talking 99 here in town. Hondo, Uvalde 100, Carrizo Springs, Catula 102, Del Rio probably 105, Gonzales about 95. But tomorrow's really our pinnacle. That's our peak for the week. 99 tomorrow, but then notice how we start to stair step our way down in terms of those high temperatures. Lower 90s Thursday, Friday, and into the weekend, we could be talking high temperatures back in the 80s. So there's the upper level ridge, that's the heat high. That's going to slowly break down. And another significant aspect of that heat high breaking down is not that just that temperatures will fall off a little bit, but rain chances return. And I think daily rain chances, they're not necessarily going to be big chances of rain, but at least a chance of a few isolated pop up storms every day, starting on Thursday. That'll last all the way through the upcoming weekend. And there is a potential as we get into the weekend, depending on our upper level pattern, how it pans out, there's a potential we could increase these storm chances a little bit more. So that's something we'll be monitoring closely, particularly for Saturday, Sunday. Otherwise, tomorrow morning near 70 at sunrise, already 90 by noon. So if you're still working out at home and you want to get in that exercise, the earlier the better, that's for sure. Near 100 for the afternoon high, wall-to-wall -wall sunshine all day. 
Still sunny on Wednesday, little extra cloud cover Thursday on through the upcoming weekend, and that's when we have those daily pop up shower and storm chances uh, starting on Thursday, lasting through the weekend and even on into Memorial Day. Can't rule out a few rogue showers or storms developing, but at least we know that high temperatures will be falling off as those rain chances come back into the picture. All right, thanks so much, Adam. All right, some good news today for sports fans and sports casters. <laughs> yes, I'm not talking about the bars opening on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> That is also great news. Yeah, I'm talking about the lessening of restrictions in the sports world. Yeah, because now pro sports can return on May the 31st. But right now, all team facilities can open in the state, including the Spurs. But why the Spurs facility will remain closed for now? When we come back, more about that. And a Cowboy is ready for his comeback when we come back. And here they come off turn number four. The pace car is in. Green flag. NASCAR is back. It may be without fans. It may be without announcers at the track. But NASCAR follows UFC as the first sports to return during the COVID-19 pandemic. First time since March in big board sports, but first. The day is a day that all gyms are allowed to reopen by Texas Governor Greg Abbott. And the question is, will NBA facilities seize on that opportunity today? The Spurs have told us they will not reopen their practice facility until they can be assured their players would be safe in doing so. And among other things, would be required testing for the coronavirus. The Los Angeles Clippers opened their team facility today, which comes after the Lakers did so on Saturday. The Cleveland Cavaliers are one of the first to do so. The NBA gave the green light on May the 8th, but state restrictions prevented the opening of NBA facilities in Texas until today. When they do open, only four players will be allowed into the practice facility at one time and no coaches. It is a first step in getting the season to continue until that happens. Getting back on the court, even without fans, is still on hold. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Claiming he is ready to go and as healthy as ever, Cowboy star linebacker Leighton Vander Esch is ready to return to off-season activities in person when that is allowed in the NFL. That is what he told CBSSports.com after undergoing neck surgery this past January to help him recover from an injury that limited him to just nine games last season. The Wolf made a name for himself during his rookie season with the Cowboys when he totaled 140 tackles just to make sure the Cowboys re-signed Sean Lee to a one-year $4.5 million contract with $2 million guaranteed guaranteed during this offseason after he stepped in for Vander Esch last season. While NASCAR is helping us get back into the sports business, college football still has some time left to recover. The big question is, when will players be allowed back on campus? At Texas State in San Marcos, Jake Spavital is dealing with the biggest challenge of his coaching life during the COVID-19 pandemic in just his second season as a head coach of the Bobcats after finishing 3-9 and nine last year. But he tells our own R.J. Marquez during this Zoom interview that he plans to have his players back on a voluntary basis in as little as two weeks from today we've all agreed that you know we're going to start these three fa phases of re-socialization where we can start voluntary workouts in june of 10 groups or less and then when we get to july there's going to be 50 uh, people or less and then when we get to uh, july 27th we got a six-week return to play protocol so we can start september 5th so that's that's kind of the vibe and that's kind of where it's going and and uh, you know, that's just kind of the plan that we're sticking to it. But as football coaches, you just got to be able to react to changes. Now, what about testing players once they return to campus? That was another question put to Spavadol. We'll have to start that June 1st. It's it's our protocol of what these kids can do. It's like when you walk into the building, they're going to have to have temperature checks. And then you'll have symptom checks with questions. And um, eventually that's how the protocol is in these small groups. And when you get to larger groups, there's probably going to hopefully they have like antibody tests uh, done by then or just, uh, if they feel comfortable with uh, one of those testing policies. But, um, you know, there's that's kind of how our return to, to the campus phase is. But then they've talked about how everybody will have to do a COVID-19 test weekly, um, you know, if we're going to start playing in front of fans. Now, the Bobcats are hoping that their plans will lead to an on-time kickoff of their 2020 season when Texas State is slated to host SMU on September the 5th. NASCAR is back big time. Next. 
Only drivers and team personnel are allowed in a Darlington Motor Speedway on Sunday to get back to live racing in the best controlled environment NASCAR could provide. Drivers had to wear masks outside of the car, and any interviews were conducted six feet away. But when they dropped the green flag, a milestone of recovery was upon us. Brad Keselowski won the pole by the luck of the draw. Since the track only hosted the 400-mile event, no practice or qualifying. Ryan Newman was in the field for the first time since his horrific crash on the last lap of the Daytona 500, finishing 15th in his return. Seven-time champion Jim Johnson crashed while leading on the final lap of stage one. When it was all said and done, Kevin Harvick beat out Alex Bowman to take the checkered flag and start sports recovery from the coronavirus. I was excited to get back in the car. Uh, today was just a, a well-executed day. We were fortunate. To, uh, you know, we had the, the first pit stall, kept our track position all day, and, and were able to, um, you know, have a, a good bush light forward and have good restarts and do everything we needed to do to to keep our track position. And, and in the end, that was that was the key for us. Uh, we had a fast car, but um, you know, staying out front was was um, was the key to the equation. Yeah, NASCAR is going to try and cram in six more events, six more races in the next 10 days, including the Coca-Cola 600 this Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, I think they've got a race Wednesday back at Darling. <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah, yeah, I was watching. Very good. Yeah. Proud of you. I miss live Craig. sports. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Still to come, an ABC reporter donates plasma after recovering from COVID-19. See the moment she met the man her donation helped. And plus, we spoke with a local gym owner who is eager to have his members return today. A look at the safety precautions his facility is taking. As doctors experiment with new treatments and researchers try to come up with a vaccine for, for coronavirus patients, an emotional greeting between an ABC News correspondent who donated her blood plasma and the patient who it helped save. ABC's Romina Puka has more. With no vaccine yet available, it has been experimental treatments that have been aiding in saving the lives of COVID-19 patients. One study from the Mayo Clinic finds that transfusions of recovered patients' blood plasma into sick patients is helping. The golden plasma. Our own Kaylee Hartung donated her blood plasma after recovering from the coronavirus and was able to trace her donation to Daniel Macias. The doctors told us my dad had 20% chance of living. After recovering with the help of Kaylee's plasma, a parade of familiar faces cheering Daniel on, including Kaylee, who met Daniel face to face for the first time. How are you feeling? I'm feeling really good. Yeah. Really good. It, it was just right away, the next day, he started doing better. And three days later, three days later, we took the tube, your breathing tube away. Oh, you you can breathe cool. on your own, only three days later. On top of promising treatments, there is also news of a promising vaccine. American biotech company Moderna announced that in phase one of a clinical trial, the first one involving human test subjects in the U.S., its experimental COVID-19 vaccine produced antibodies that could neutralize the novel coronavirus and so far appears to do so safely. Moderna CEO saying they could not be happier about this interim data. The company last week won the U.S. Health Agency's fast track label to speed up the regulatory review. Phase two and three of the trial are due to take place this summer. But scientists continue to learn new things about this virus. More than a dozen sailors, some symptomatic, others asymptomatic, aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt, a Navy ship that had a widespread outbreak, recently tested positive again. After being quarantined for 14 days, then testing negative twice. Medical experts aren't sure how this could have happened, but it is a reminder of how little we know about this new virus. It also shows us that what we've what we've known for for a long time is that this is a, a very stubborn infectious disease. Some scientists believe the 13 sailors who were originally asymptomatic didn't have a lot of antibodies so they were able to get sick again or they still had remnants of the dead virus. Though other experts believe that the initial test may have had false results. In Colorado, Romina Puga, ABC News. Until the crisis is over, every weeknight at 9, we're trying to separate the facts from the fiction surrounding the new coronavirus. Tonight, we are joined by Jared Pena. He is not only a bar owner, but he's been a leader in our local cocktail industry. He knows a lot of people in the industry. And so I'm imagining you were watching what the governor had to say today with particular interest. Just a little bit. What was your reaction? Um, I understand uh, what he's trying to do, and there's a lot of people hurting, and I, I, 
I want a lot of uh, I want my industry to feel like they have a, sh a shot and some hope that you know we can go back to some sense of normalcy. But so I support it in, in, in a way. You know, it's a little scary because there's still you know cases that are mounting up. But you, so let's talk 25 percent. You can you make it on 25 percent occupancy? No, no, I mean not at all. Why not? Well, you have to imagine because you I mean you have rent structures. You have you're, a lot of people are paying rent structures based on market rate. Market rate, you know, six months ago to a year ago is really different now because the market does not exist anymore. So you're paying twenty four to thirty eight to forty four dollars a square foot when you can't afford that rent anymore. So I mean, so your rent now is you know the typical rent structures are around six to eight percent of gross sales so if your sales drop by by sixty percent seventy percent that rent number now equates to more like a twenty to twenty five percent of your gross sales i mean you ta then you tack on your cost of goods and your labor i mean there's no money there's there is ways to to survive it but it requires landlords to to shell out and help out and more importantly it would help you, what would help is actually having the comptroller or someone in the state help us uh, relieve some of that tax burden that we have. And I mean, listen, we're in a red state. You know, we all believe in small government and lower taxes. This is a perfect time to uh, preach that type of a uh, thought process. Yeah, particularly what they call sin taxes. Explain what those are and what you would like to see done with those. You know, so we pay eight and a quarter percent. So now what we do is when you buy an alcoholic beverage, Eight and a quarter percent is ta is charged to your uh, uh, bill. So you'll see if you're buying a a ten dollar drink, you're paying eight and a quarter percent. So you're going to be paying your total gross bill is going to be ten dollars and eighty two cents. So we get that. So we take that eight and a quarter, and then we pay six and a half percent on the gross amount. So we're paying a total of fourteen and a half percent tax. What I'm proposing. And I'm, I'm talking to local leaders. I have some phone calls tomorrow with some uh, state representative people. Is just I'm not talking about uh, permanently. I'm talking about until this crisis is gone. What we need is we don't need a handout. We need a hand up. We need people. We need the government to help us. Like hey, this six and a half percent could equate to an extra twenty percent more in our pockets. Because if you're running on margins of 10 to 20 percent, six and a quarter is huge. If you're not a bar owner, if you're not a business owner, if you're somebody like me who you know, know knows that it's rough out there, how would you describe what's happening right now to bar owners? I'm seeing people, and it's tearing us apart because there's people, we understand the, the health aspect of making sure people shouldn't be you know, we should try to, we're trying to prevent people from getting sick. We, I mean, I think that's really, as, an, as a good operator, you have to try to figure out ways to prevent people from getting sick. At the same time, you got bills to pay. You got comptroller calling you about paying your taxes. You have electric bills, you have your landlords. And most of the landlords have been pretty cool, but I mean, what's gonna happen in three months from now? It, it's, it's crazy, like a lot of people are hurting. People need to open up right now. Like we're lucky, we, we were in the middle of an acquisition with, with Jefferson Bank. And you know, we, we're, we can ride this out a little bit, but I mean, there are a lot of people that don't have that. Most of the people don't. And, and, and people are showing, and it, the, this level of stress, it's, it's affecting everybody. Talk about, I, 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 we talked about this a little bit in the break before we started. You were concerned that we haven't seen the worst of this yet, correct? By far, no, we, are, we have not seen, this is, this is just the beginning. The big issue right now is what no one's talking about is the oil. And I'm gonna, I'll tell you a quick little story. My friend John Carvajal, uh, who's really connected in the food and beverage world in hotel and lodging, and he invited me to a hotel and lodging meeting in 2015. A year before that, so that was in December. In December of 2014, oil uh, took a dip, a big dip. And it wasn't until the summer and the fall of 2015, we we're like, this is kind of a soft market. What's going on? Like, so I remember calling operators like my buddy Chad Carey. I was like, hey, what's going on? Are you? How is your fall going? And he even said it's soft. 
And then John invited me to the Hotel and Lodging Association meeting in 2015. And they were talking about the projections over the next five years in hotel and lodging. It, it, everything was just going down. And the reason for that was, ho- was because of oil. And everyone, I, I'll never forget being next to all these operators in hotels and lodging. And when they showed those numbers in 2015, you heard, you heard gasped in the whole audience. People were freaking out because they were not anticipating that oil hit that hard, was hitting hotel and lodging that hard. Because a lot of people don't realize that 30% of our economy here in Texas is oil-based. So when you take that away, you have less pe- less uh, banks giving you money, less people spending money, less money flowing around, and it trickles down to our industry. And it takes nine months to a year. That's what I was going to say. And that's an effect we won't feel for, you know, eight, nine months. That, and that's my biggest scare. That's what I what I think about when I've been preaching and telling a lot of people. I have conversations tomorrow with some uh, uh, some local people and some state people. I am worried about that because that's going to be the next calling. I mean, we're talking. You know, you're talking about people closing their businesses now. That's going to be nothing compared to nine months if we don't offer some type of relief so that we can combat the economy that's going to come at us at full force in nine months to a year. What, what do you want to leave our viewers with tonight? Final thought I'll give to you. Just what, just know that history repeats itself. Oil is going to hit us and we're going to need the food and beverage industry and every industry is going to need help. And we need to really work together and keep in talking to our local representatives about protecting our economy and protecting local business. Jared Pena, appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. All right. Take care, buddy. We'll be right back. Today is the day that gym owners, gym rats, everyone in between have been waiting for. Gyms and fitness centers across the state get to reopen their doors with restrictions, of course. Max Massey with how one local gym owner is prepared to get back in business. I couldn't even stay asleep. I woke up like 30 minutes before my alarm just to make sure I got here and do uh, my leg workouts. Couldn't wait since last month I've been aching to come back. When the owner, Michael Lajeunesse, heard that he had to lock down his facility, it hit him hard. But now they are ready for a bulky comeback. We're stoked that we can reopen now and obviously happy that we can like service our members the way that we want. So whether it's weights, body exercises, or cardio. No matter how you're getting your fitness, one of the top priorities is safety and making sure that you're as clean as possible. We're limiting the amount of people that are allowed in the gym, so 25% capacity is what's being limited. And we're following all the regulations, obviously, that we have to for the CDC and obviously what comes down from Bear County. This is probably one of the cleanest gyms I've been to, to be honest. As long as we practice safe distancing and all that kind of stuff, then we should be fine. Micah tells us his mission with the gym is to help San Antonio help our community fight obesity and fight all the problems that's associated with it. A message that resonates with David. At one point in my life, I was really, really heavier and I started getting like high blood pressure and di- you know, pre-diabetes. So the doctor said, you either need to get on this medication or you need to get fit. I don't want to take the medication. I'd rather get fit. Just do your thing. It's International Chest Day. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. More Uber employees are set to lose their jobs, about 3,000 to be exact. The ride-hailing giant announced the cuts in an email to staffers this morning. These latest cuts come just two weeks after the company announced plans to slash 3,700 full-time jobs. Uber says it's also closing or consolidating around 45 offices all over the world. All of this comes from reduced demand for rides with so many people staying home during the pandemic. Meanwhile, Delta hopes more people will be ready to fly this summer. The airline announced today it plans to resume some domestic and international flights to suspended routes next month. Delta said it will add daily flights from several U.S. cities to Canada, as well as flights to the Caribbean, Central America, Mexico, South America, and Europe. Delta says it wants its passengers to feel confident in a safe flying experience. They also have more cleaning measures and a new 60% seating capacity in place and are requiring everyone to wear face coverings. Take a live look outside with live cam this evening. A very hot day, I would say, today. Well, and, and whenever Adam Caskey yeah. says words like record challenging, mm. when he's talking about highs, yep. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. And it's only May.
You know, some people love it. Yeah. They do. So yeah. I know some folks that crave this, but you're right. It's uh, only May and yeah, record challenging heat as we go into tomorrow. Today we were four degrees shy of the record. Tomorrow we are anticipating a high about 99 degrees and the record is 101. So yeah, definitely challenging the record. I just think we'll be a little shy of it. And then you see how the temperatures stair step their way down for the remainder of the week and into the upcoming weekend. Now in the off chance, you know, we do hit 100 tomorrow. Obviously it's possible one degree Fahrenheit, not a big deal. The average first 100 degree day, according to the last 30 year running climatology is June 24th. So this would be coming about a month early. Potentially we could reach it tomorrow. I think we'll be a little shy, but it would be the earliest 100 degree day since 2009. All right, so that's a stat for you. All right, let's take a look at Medina Lake. Of course, we had some decent rainfall. We have the high heat out there. There's some ev evaporation going on. I want to take a, take a look and give you an update on the lake level. It's 68% full, about 15 feet below the conservation pool and the six months change. Well, look at that. We're still seven feet lower than six months ago. We had some good rain. We could use some more, especially for Medina Lake. Temperatures right now mostly in the 70s, 79 in New Braunfels, 73 Bernie Stage, 77 at Stinson, some 80s farther to the south and west of San Antonio, even 90 degrees still in Del Rio. And temperatures will continue to fall off tonight. I think we'll settle down right near 70 degrees early tomorrow morning, which is actually pretty close to average. It's just the afternoon high temperatures will be well above average. Quiet day across the state. The higher terrain, we had some pop up showers in Mexico and even in West Texas, but still we have the big bump in the upper level flow, big upper level ridge. That's the big blue H, the big heat high that's settling overhead and it's going to press down on us even more into tomorrow. That's why we're expecting those upper 90s near 100. As for rain chances, I don't think we have any shot the next couple of days, Tuesday and Wednesday, but then with our weather pattern shifting, temperatures falling off a bit. Starting on Thursday, we'll have some daily isolated storm chances. So about a 30% every day, Thursday through Saturday. And we may increase that a little bit more as we get into parts of the weekend. Uh, time will tell. We'll keep you updated on the weekend rain chances. I know it is Memorial Day weekend at all. 70 degrees in the morning tomorrow, 99 in the afternoon is south wind at 5 to 15, and then wall to wall sunshine again on Wednesday. A little extra cloud cover in the sky Thursday and Friday and even lasting through the weekend. But as the temperatures go back down into the 80s, we maybe just be seeing those rain chances rise up for the upcoming weekend. Tomorrow's going to be interesting. Thanks so much, Adam. Well, is your current computer struggling to keep up with working from home? Memorial Day sales are on the way, so we've got some recommendations for those looking for a replacement. Is your computer cutting it? If you're working from home, attending class online, or even socializing more through video chat, you may find your old computer is not up to the job. As we head into Memorial Day sales, 12 on your side's Marilyn Morris has some recommendations from Consumer Reports. Soon after Adam Schaefer began helping his kids with remote schooling, he realized it was time to replace his 12 year old computer. Having a lot of freezing up um, problems with, on the websites and we only could have just about two websites open at a time. Otherwise, it'll crash. If that sounds familiar, it may be time to buy a new computer that will keep up with new demands. Laptops are a great option because they're portable, more powerful, and less expensive than they used to be. If you like PCs, the Lenovo Flex is a Consumer Reports Best Buy. Their take? It's convertible, comfortable, and convenient to use. If you prefer a Mac, one of CR's top-rated laptops is the 16-inch Apple MacBook Pro. Testers say the long battery life could last beyond a full day's work. As for desktops, new all-in-one models where the computer is built into the monitor are popular. They're powerful and they save space. This 27-inch model from Lenovo is a CR Best Buy. Testers found it's fast and the touchscreen is convenient. As for Mac lovers like Adam, CR recommends this 21 and a half inch iMac. It has built in speakers and its dedicated graphics card lets you do things like edit video at top speed. If now isn't a good time to spend money on a new computer, there is a free option. You can turn an outdated PC laptop into a Chromebook. We have a link to detailed instructions on how to do that on KSAT.com. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News.
If you're thinking of heading to an Apple store to get that new laptop, well, you can expect some major changes to how the stores operate. As more locations begin to open, Apple will require temperature checks at the door and face coverings. That's according to a statement from the company. Nearly 100 Apple stores have already reopened around the world. The company is also limiting the number of people inside. Curbside drop off and pickup options at some locations will also be allowed. All right, are you having trouble getting the kids to sleep? How about a bedtime story read by Mary Poppins herself? Details next. The woman behind the world's favorite nanny is trying to help families bond during these difficult times. Julie Andrews, famous for playing such iconic roles as Mary Poppins and Maria Von Trapp in The Sound of Music, has started a new podcast reading children's books. Andrews is working with her daughter, Emma Walton Hamilton, who is a children's book author. Andrew says this is something the pair had been planning for some time and its release was escalated by the coronavirus pandemic. Yeah, Julie Andrews, that's a good you yeah, know, podcast perfect. partner to have. And for those who may be tired of watching the same things over and over during the pandemic, you should know George Lopez releasing his first comedy special on Netflix on June 30th. It's titled George Lopez will do it for half. While this is the comedian's first special on the streaming service, he's had four HBO specials the most recent happening in 2017. All right, get ready for the heat tomorrow. Upper 90s here in San Antonio. 100 degrees just west of town and southwest of town where it's usually a little bit warmer. I think Del Rio about 105 tomorrow afternoon. Wall to wall sunshine. Wednesday sunny, but we'll start to see those temperatures trending downward. Lower 90s by Thursday, Friday and into the weekend. Probably some mid and upper 80s with some daily chances of isolated storms by let's Thursday. Hope, let's hope the AC is working in the car. Mm -hmm. That does it for the night beat. Don't forget, good morning, San Antonio at 4.30. Good night.